Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love being in your presence, Lord. We love being with your people. We love your word. The lively oracles that we read. We thank you, Lord. We praise your holy name. Come and inspire us today, please, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit. Come and dwell in our hearts in a way that we have, haven't known before. We ask for a new revelation of you, a new word for our lives, a new encouragement for us. Lord, come and have your way here, please. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So I want to start by um, saying thank you to everyone who helped yesterday. It was a great day here uh, as we watched the coronation. Uh, lovely to see so many faces as well. And we had a great time and it was a, quite a moving ceremony all in all. So thank you. Uh, the, all the notices are in the sheet. I haven't got any additional notices as far as I'm aware. Um, so... Missionary prayer meeting on Tuesday, um, four o'clock on Zoom. So the missionary prayer meeting is four o'clock on Zoom, just to confirm that. Um, let's, let's praise the Lord and, and declare that his love is amazing. Please stand if you wish to. is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain from beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah. Feel it rising, all the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. I can feel this God song rising up in me. take your seats. Um, hallelujah was one of the main words, I think, yesterday, wasn't it, in the coronation ceremony, time and time again, which I was really pleased to hear. It was great. Um, we're going to have our short talk today, and Natasha's going to um, bring something for us to contemplate. Yep. Right. Yep. Just get out of the way. Yep. Good morning. So, it, because of the subject, it was a bit of a difficult 
time to work out what to say and how to say it. So I came upon this short talk and I thought, compassion is what I'm going to be talking about. And encouragement. Have you ever felt time when you felt low? Maybe you needed someone there to lend a listening ear. Did you ever feel like you could have been there for someone else, but did not know how to help them? It's okay, not everyone is perfect. And that's such a relief to know. We all make mistakes. We all fail. And we're all unique. We each have different personalities and gifts that we are all given. And God knows us. He knows his children. He knows that when we fall down, we don't always want to get back up again. Sometimes we want to stay there and cry for a while and think, why me? Given all that, it's then up to us to get back up again and put one foot in front of the other. And sometimes some people just need a little more time than others. And that's when we need to encourage them, to encourage them to keep moving and to never stop. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. As the king has just had his coronation, he will need plenty of help with both private and public offence. He will most certainly need help with knowing what to say and when to say it. Just because he's king does not mean he knows it all. He will need God's guidance and he will need the leaders around him to guide him in how to act and what to do. He will certainly need Camilla's help with both private and public events. He will need her to be the shoulder to cry on when he needs and he'll also need her to be his listening ear. So imagine if you imagine a peony or maybe a tomato plant or just one of your favorite flowers, it starts getting droopy. And to help it, you might give it some manure or some plant feed. You might move it from one spot to the other depending on the plant's needs. Um, you might even stick a stick in the, um, by the plant and put twine around it to support it. And hopefully over time, it will grow. It will become beautiful again and produce fruit. You are encouraging your plant just like we need to encourage people around us. And God knows each plant. He knows each needs before we do. He encourages us by giving us knowledge, books or the internet in how to care for them. He gives us knowledge in how to put together a cake or a decent dinner or even to build something incredible. He gives us knowledge in how to care for one another. Yet so many of us do not take the time out to help when help is needed. God knows each and every one of us, just like he knows each plant and animal that are under his care. In Psalms 121 verse 1 to 2, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and the earth. I see God as a parent, one that would discipline me when I deserve it, but one who will also be there with open arms. He knows what I do wrong, and yet he also knows when I do something and he's pleased with. We often teach our children to do the right thing, even when no one is watching. So why do we as adults not do the same thing? Even when there is someone watching, of course that's God. So in Mark 
Chapter 11, 24 says, Therefore I tell you, whether you ask in prayer, believe it and you shall receive it, and I will be yours. And it will be yours, sorry. And I'm going to complete my short talk with a little poem. It's called God's Promise. God has not promised skies always blue, flowers June pathways all our lives through. God has not promised sun without rain, and joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God has promised strength for the day, rest for the labour, light for the way. Grace for the trials and help from above, unfailing sympathy, sympathy and undying love. Thank you. It's always good to be encouraged and that was very encouraging and encourages us to turn to the Lord who is our encourager after all we lift our eyes to the hills where does our hope come from the Lord Almighty the maker of heaven and earth let's take some time now to tidy up not clear up tidy up after the little tidy up time um, I don't think I need to do any extra notices, do I? By the looks of it, no. Um, but having said that, you know I talked about last week changing the uh, money talk. We're going to do that now instead of doing that earlier. Um, so let's take that out now, way. Eh? While Tim gets the oh, it's already up. Well done, Tim. So uh, tithes and offerings. Let's see where we've been so far. Just go through the whole lot. So this will be number six, I think. Yeah. And oh, 5.5. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the eternal perspective. Um, when we have money, and if we think that we are poor, well, I suppose it's a relative thing. If we think we're rich, that can be a relative thing as well. If we compare ourselves to other people around the world, we are definitely rich. Rich because we have freedom. Rich because we have running tap water. Those types of things make us rich. We have an income disposable income sometimes but with that comes a responsibility and um, having money is a responsibility for us and we need to be responsible with our responsibility however we get our money whether it's through work or whether it's through benefits or inheritance however it comes we need to be responsible with it before god if God says to somebody, I want you to give all your money to the poor, well, then you should go and do that. I've never known that to happen, and it would involve a lot of prayer, but if it is certain that God is saying that, then that's what a person should do. If God says to somebody that they should share it with other people that they know, well, then you should go and do that because God is saying that and you have a responsibility before God with your money. If he says to you, uh, well, keep it for your keep it for yourself because you've worked hard for it. Well, you're probably not hearing from God because God doesn't want you to hoard your money. God wants you to be generous with it. Luke 24, uh, Luke 6, sorry, we pop that up. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. The other um, translation is, for you have already received your consolation. Is it better to be rich in this life and poor in the next or poor in this life? 
and rich in the next. What I want to encourage us to, to do is to have an eternal perspective with our money. We need to look into the future, not, not just what we see in this life. Here comes Pablo. We need to get a table ready. Hiya, come on in, welcome. For those who are rich, the danger is about being caught up in the moment of this life. Money can make us focus on material things. It can change our perspective from eternal to immediate. Money can distract us from our eternal perspective. It is better for us to store up our treasures in heaven than to store up our treasures in our bank account. It's okay to be rich, but you have to be responsible with your riches. It's okay to have extra money in your bank account, but we need to be wise with what we do with it. That is just one of, I don't know, there are hundreds and hundreds of verses in the Bible to do with money. I've never counted them up, but I've heard on a number of occasions that Jesus talks more about money than he does anything else. That's how important it is. That's how important our perspective about money should be. Let's just leave that. I'll leave that with you now with some prayer. Lord, we are always in your debt, whether it is financially or spiritually. We are always owing you, Lord, and you are so generous to us, giving us your love without restrictions giving us your salvation and forgiveness, even though we have done nothing to deserve it. Lord, we praise you. We ask, Lord, that you would please give us the wisdom with the finances that we've got. Give us an eternal perspective with our money in our bank accounts and what we do with it. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We've got a couple of more songs to sing now. So the first one will be called Oceans. And the next one after that is Open the Eyes of My Heart. Tim will pop them up. If you're here early enough on a Sunday when Tim does the loop of music, you will hear these come up. So you might already be fairly familiar with them anyway. Please stand if you wish. Sovereign hand will be my 
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you will call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk.
Please take your seats. Lord, I just thank you for your holiness that is just powerful, your presence that is wonderful. Thank you, Lord, that you've opened the eyes of our hearts already as we come before you as saved people. Thank you, Lord. We would ask that you open our eyes even further, that we would see you more. Oh, Lord, that we would see you. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Darling, let's have our reading. Can we get this up now? So this is the reading from Hosea 9. It's not comfortable to listen to. A lot of Hosea isn't, is it? But it's God's word, and um, he wants to speak to us through it. So let's listen. Do not rejoice, Israel. Do not be jubilant like the other nations, for you have been unfaithful to your God. You love the wages of a prostitute at every threshing floor. Threshing floors and wine presses will not feed the people. The new wine will fail them. They will not remain in the Lord's land. Ephraim will return to Egypt and eat unclean food in Assyria. They will not pour out wine offerings to the Lord, nor will their sacrifices please him. Such sacrifices will be to them like the bread of mourners. All who eat them will be unclean. The food will be for themselves. It will not come into the temple of the Lord. What will you do on the day of your appointed festivals, on the feast days of the Lord? Even if they escape from destruction, Egypt will gather them and Memphis will bury them. Their treasures of silver will be taken over by briars, and thorns will overrun their tents. The days of punishment are coming. The days of reckoning are at hand. Let Israel know this. Because your sins are so many and your hostility so great, the prophet is considered a fool, the inspired person a maniac. The prophet, along with my God, is the watchman over Ephraim, yet snares await him on all his paths and hostility in the house of his God. They have sunk deep into corruption as in the days of Gibeah. God will remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing the early fruit or the fig tree. But when they came to Baal Peor, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. Ephraim's glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Even if they rear children, I will bereave them of every one. Woe to them when I turn away from them. I have seen Ephraim, like Tyre, planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim will bring out their children to the slayer. Give them, Lord, what will you give them? Give them wombs that miscarry and breasts that are dry. Because of all their wickedness in Gilgal, I hated them there, 
because of their sinful deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will no longer love them. All their leaders are rebellious. Ephraim is blighted. Their root is withered. They yield no fruit. Even if they bear children, I will slay their cherished offspring. My God will reject them because they have not obeyed him. They will be wanderers among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, oh, doom and gloom. It does seem like that, doesn't it? What a reading. A reading of terror for the people who heard it at the time. A reading that would have shaken their bones. And if you take it a verse, uh, if you take a verse out of it, then you can see that people misunderstand the whole message. Because people will look at certain verses, like the one where it says that there will be no birth, no pregnancy, no conception. If you take that out of context, you will, you will get a misconstrued wrong message about what God is saying. You only need to scratch the surface a little to see that there is actually a lot of encouragement. Even in this chapter, there is encouragement. We will get to that as we go through. And I hope that by the end of this sermon, you will recognize that we are homeward bound. Not bound by this world, not bound by the constraints of sin any longer. We are homeward bound. And Jesus is our home. Now, it's been a couple of weeks since I've, I've been up here. So let's have a little recap of where we've come from. The first chapter, as we've gone through it chapter by chapter, was the introduction of Homer and Gomez and their children. Jezreel, synonymous with bloodshed. Lo Rohama means unloved. And Lo Ami meaning not my people. This was a prophetic statement about the situation that Israel was in at the time. The second chapter was God saying to the people, don't leave me. Don't go away from me. Stop sinning. Stay with me. It's as though God was pleading with them. The third chapter was where Hosea buys back Gomer from essentially the slave market. He redeems her, which was a picture that we can see now as Christians born in the New Testament era, that this was a picture of God redeeming us through Christ, who bought us back. The next chapter, chapter four, was the courtroom scene. The charge was laid out. It was as though they were told to stand. The court was in session and the charge was there was no knowledge of God in the land. And because there was no knowledge of God, there was no love of him. Because there was no love of him, there was no faith. Which is the same charge that we have today in our land, in our society. We need to pay attention to that. And then the battle cry comes out in the next chapter. That actually because of the charge which was proved to be true, the people are then enemies of God. But there was still hope if they repented. There was still a possibility of restored relationship that we can now enjoy so easily through Jesus Christ. The next chapter was describing the purpose of judgment, which we can see 
is salvation. God judges us in order for us to repent and see salvation. Sometimes it's not what we want to hear, but God knows what is best. And ultimately, his plans for us are good plans. And then we had the images, didn't we, of like an overheated oven or a half-baked loaf. Again, God's calling his people to repentance because he loves us. He calls the ones that he loves to repentance. If you've been called to repentance, that's because God loves you and he cares for you. And he actually wants the best for you. And then last week we heard from Jackie and she went through chapter eight where the eagle was over the house of the Lord. Syria being the eagle ready to swoop down. But there was a saviour involved. Jesus being the saviour. If we look to him, we are saved from calamity. The ultimate calamity being eternity without God. You see, in every chapter that looks bad, you just scratch the surface a little and there is hope and there is encouragement. And I know that's not a surprise to you because you're used to that. That's the way the Bible works. This lively oracle, as we heard yesterday. Hosea 9, well, there has a theme in it about home. Confucius says that the strength of a nation is derived from the intricacy and integrity of its homes. The strength of our nation is derived from the integrity of the homes. If our homes are broken, the integrity of the nation is broken, is what he is saying. Because homes are so important to us, right? What do they mean to you? Tell me, I'm asking, what does home, the image that you have in your mind, what does that mean to you? Security, safety. What else? Peace. Peace. Comfort. Shelter. Love. Be yourself, relaxing. All these things is what home means to us, right? It's important for us. It evokes in us feelings. And right back in Genesis 1, God created the world and it was good. The plants were good. The beasts were good. It was good for everything. And he even gave mankind, the first to have relationship with him, Adam and Eve, a place that they could call home. Eden. The home that was perfect. What happened? Well, you know the story, right? They rebelled. And the consequence was exile. It's a harsh consequence for the mistake that they made. But it was a just consequence as well. Eden was their home and they were exiled because of rebellion. And then there was Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. And the consequence was a judgment which was they were then cast out into the wilderness to wander as homeless people, Cain and his offspring, homeless people. When you see somebody outside who is homeless, it means more than not having a roof over their head, as you yourselves have described. It means the lack of all of the things that you think of as valuable. Homelessness is a horrible thing, horrible thing for people. But God, in his grace, said to Abraham, there's going to be a new beginning. 
I'm going to make you the father of nations. And you're going to have a new home. And the seed was sown for the promised land in the heart of Abraham and his offspring. Moses then take, took up the mantle and took the people out of Egypt into the Exodus. And at Mount Sinai, God said to them that you're going to go towards your new home now, your promised land. And when we read in Hosea 9 just now, as Jackie read it to us, verse 10 talks about God seeing them at that time as though they were grapes in the wilderness. Grapes being a lovely image of how he saw them, succulent, juicy, wanted fruit. He saw them as grapes in the wilderness. But Moses didn't take the people into the promised land. That was Joshua's responsibility. The next generation went to the new home, the land of milk and honey. Well, it's milk and honey because if there's milk, there must be pasture land. If there's pasture land, then you've got cows. If you've got cows, then you've got other cattle and livestock, then you can eat meat. It's the land of milk. It's the land of honey. Well, if you've got honey, then you've got bees, right? If you've got bees, bees pollinate crops. It means that you're going into a land where you can grow crops, not a desert land, a land of milk and honey, a land of rest, provision, protection, safety, relaxation, love. But what happened? Hosea tells us what happens. They messed up. And they messed up big time. They messed up so badly that there was going to be another exile. The eagle was over the house of Israel. Now they'd already been told all of this, the blessings and the curses about being obedient to God in their home. Moses wrote about it in Deuteronomy, where he said about the blessings and curses, the curses being exile. So not only had they had the experience as a people of going from home to exile a number of times, they were also warned about it by God personally. They knew the consequences of sin, the consequences of exile, and it's still the same today for people in the world. If there is no forgiveness in their lives, the consequences is exile for him in the next life. It's the same as it was then, as it is now. And there are a couple of things I want to bring out of this reading. And specifically the place names, because they are symbolic and significant to what was going on at the time. So the first one that Jackie read was Baal Pear. Now, um, we've got a picture of it. Now, that's an artist's interpretation about what was going on at Baal Pear. Baal Pear was actually named Pear, P. E O R, but Baal, because Baal worship went on there. It was a high place, a place of elevation. And what they used to do in high places was thresh out the wheat. So they would chuck the wheat in the air, and the chaff would be blown away, which is the husk of the wheat. And then it would fall down, and then they would gather that together. Then they'd chuck it up, and then the more husks would be blown away. But what they also started doing on those high places, because the wind was blowing enough to blow the husks away, was they started to worship Baal. They worshiped Baal on the high places, and that is detestable before God. Let's have the next slide, please, Tim, just to show you where it is on the screen. That's where we're looking at. There's the, uh, the Dead Sea and um, 
just to the right there is Baal Pur. Israel kind of like being the northern part. Judah, the southern part, just down here, the smaller part. And the next clip, please, Tim. That's what Baal Poa looks like today. And you can see that there are, there are elevations, higher places, where people would have worshipped Baal Poa there and threshed their wheat. But Baal Poa isn't just... Uh, significant for that reason because there is another historical significance for Baal Poa. In the book of Numbers we read that Balaam was contracted by Barak, Balak the king, to curse Israel but found that he couldn't do it. He was unable to curse Israel and had to bless them. He had no choice. God made him do that. However, in Numbers 31, we read that he did give advice, however, to Balak, the king. And the advice was to take the Moabite women to seduce the men of Israel. And that's what they did. And where did they do it? They did it at Baal Poa. That was the place that Israel was seduced by the Moabite women. And even to the extent where, as Moses was crying outside the tent of meeting, one Israelite man took a woman who seduced him back to his tent in front of Moses as he was crying outside the tent of meeting. Phineas was also there, and he saw that happen, and he took a spear and he ran it through both the man and the woman at that point. He realised what was going on and he realised the consequences of what was going on and then worshipping God. God at that point allowed a plague to happen and 24,000 people died of a plague because of what went on at Baal Poa. What was going to go on now in Israel at that time, now that they were worshipping Baal again? What do you think God was going to do? Well, he took Assyria as his servant and allowed them to invade Israel. Hosea prays, and I'll read out the prayer. Give them, Lord, what you will give them. Give them wombs that miscarry and breasts that are dry. Now, that is a prayer that's coming from desperation. Sometimes when our relatives and the ones that we love are in trouble, we pray for them to be out of trouble. But on this instance, Hosea is praying for the trouble to open their eyes to repentance. Sometimes when our family and our loved ones are in trouble, we need to pray, not that the trouble goes, but actually that the trouble leads them to repentance so that they come back to God. And some of our family members I know within this congregation are in absolute turmoil at the moment. So maybe the prayer should be, Lord, have your will. Bring them back to repentance. <clears throat> the next particular place I want to bring up is Gilgal. Again, we have it on the map just to show you where it is. Right there. So there's the River Jordan. And Gilgal is on the left-hand side of that. Why is that significant? Well, it's because right there is where God says that he began to hate them. Right there is where the real problem started. Because of their wickedness in Gilgal, I hated them there. The NIV actually is more polite 
than the King James Version, because it goes on to say, because of their sinful deeds, but in the King James, it says, because of their evil deeds. It makes it harsher, because actually what they were doing was extremely bad in their worshipping of Baal. At Gilgal. At Gilgal. What happened? Well, it's significant for us, I suppose, in a way, because they coronated a king in Gilgal. Saul was their first king. Samuel was so upset about it, but God said to him, don't be upset, Samuel, because it's not you they've rejected. It's me. And by rejecting God, they sowed the seed for their future disobedience to him by choosing Saul as their king over God. There is also another significance of Gilgal. Let's have the next. Is there another picture, Tim? Yeah. That as Joshua crossed the River Jordan, he laid 12 stones. And those 12 stones represented the people of Israel as they came out of Exodus. At that point, their exile was reversed and they came home. And at Gilgal, they laid the 12 stones as a remembrance. This is the place now that we will remember we've come into. This is where God has led us. God has led us home. The significance of Hosea mentioning it, because he's saying that now, actually, Exodus is renewed. They're going back into exile. But praise God, because Hosea is not the end of the story. Hope emerges out of exile. Out of exile comes repentance a renewed relationship with God. There was a young boy and he went away on summer camp and uh, his parents were worried for him because he'd never been away before. This was his first time away from home. So they left it a couple of days just to uh, give him a time to settle in. But actually they wanted to ring him. And on the third day, they couldn't hold back any longer. So they picked up the phone and rang the camp and spoke to the camp leader. And the camp leader said, yeah, he's fine. Don't worry. But the mother was still a little bit worried. So she said, can I speak to him? Can I speak to my boy? So the camp leader put the boy on the phone and she asked him, how are you? Are you homesick? And the boy said, no. And the mother said, asking, trying to get some hope of maybe some, some others were homesick. Were any of the other boys homesick, she asked. And the boy said, well, yes, yeah, some are, the ones that have dogs at home. We're not always going to be homesick. We might feel homesick now in a way, but we're not always going to feel like this because one day we're going to be with Jesus. And we need to understand who Jesus is, really, in order to have some comfort about our future. He is God, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is fully God, and he is fully human. He is the only one who is faithful to God, without exception, faithful and obedient to God, even at the worst moment when everybody else had left him, he was being cursed and ridiculed on the cross. He still remained faithful to God and every curse was poured out on him, including the curse of exile. Every curse was poured out of him, including the curse of being homeless. And for all of us who put our trust in Jesus and give our lives to him, we are now homeward bound in Jesus. 
So let's gather up our thoughts of what it is to be at home, of peace and love and security and rest, relaxation. Let's gather up those thoughts because Jesus has paid our mortgage. He has paid our debt. We have a home full of good things. Look towards it. Live as people who are homeward bound. There are a couple of questions on the tables in front of you. How does Jesus put the story of God's people back on track? How does he turn things around and make us homeward bound? And what will you do tomorrow to store up your treasure in your heavenly home? So we'll have a few minutes to discuss those around the table and see what you think. Let's pray. Our living and almighty God, on the occasion yesterday of the coronation, we pray for our King Charles III and Queen Camilla as they committed themselves to ongoing lives of service. May they lean on you for wisdom and grace, humility and strength. May their home not be a palace, but a place with you. May they sense your presence with them, guiding and moulding them as they seek to fulfil the duties of the monarchy. In this moment, may we too recommit ourselves, our lives to you, sacrificially, lives of service to one another, to the communities in which we are called to be in, but above all to you, Lord, our King of kings and Lord of lords, and to the realisation of your coming kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We look towards you being homeward bound people. So Lord, please bless King Charles and Queen Camilla today and bless us too that we might all be a blessing to others. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, that you saved us from that endless circle of exile Back to you and being exiled there and getting his money. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Lord, that you are where we are and you save us from that. Because of you, we have that home. Yeah. We can come to you at any time, at any moment, and know that peace and that safety and that security and that love. It's a song that, that really describes God's attitude towards us 
It's his love that is divine. Let's turn it up a notch as well, please, Tim. Please stand if you wish to. to the world living as people who are homeward bound in Jesus' name. Amen.